Many of us have the fortune of growing up in families, a mother and father, maybe some siblings. And while sometimes those relationships are loving, oftentimes they can be fraught and unhealthy. Hate, jealousy and vengeance seep into families and tear apart the familial bonds. That is how so many true crime stories start, a family gone awry. But this story is different. This is not the case of a family that does not love each other. This is the case of a family that loves each other too much. What does it even mean to love someone too much? This is the story where you'd find that out. This is the story which weaves suicide, murder, allegations of incest and cannibalism all into one unbelievable plot. This is the story of the Kolkata House of Horror. Hey everyone, I'm Aryan. And I'm Ishwarya. And we are the duo that makes up the Desi Crime Podcast. This is where we tell true crime stories that differ from the mainstream. Untold stories of Desi killers, Desi cases and Desi crime. Okay, Aryan, I don't think we've ever had a case which combined cannibalism and incest into the same story. I'm a little nervous about this one. Ishwarya, our viewers ask us all the time, when you research for these cases, do you get nightmares? And while the answer is no for almost all of them, right. there are a few that stand out that do give me nightmares. This is one of them. And it all began on June 11th, 2015 in Kolkata, the capital city of one of India's gargantuan states, West Bengal. It was slated to be a normal Thursday in Kolkata, the city well known for its interesting intersection of colonial India and Desi India. On one hand, you have the Victorian architecture evident in the old houses and government buildings, and on the other, you have hordes of police officers in blindingly white uniforms trying to curtail the busy streets of this city. Hidden away from the hustle and bustle is the posh area of Robinson Street. The day was going on as normal with vegetable vendors hawking their produce and taxi drivers fighting for the next passenger when someone noticed a cloud of smoke coming from a small bathroom window of a house. This house was number three on Robinson Street. Smoke coming from houses in India is not an uncommon sight, but let me remind you, this is a posh area. And the smoke wasn't coming out of a chimney, it was coming out from a bathroom window. The billowing black cloud caught the eyes of more locals and soon people realized something was not right. Someone dialed 101 and the fire brigade and cops were called. It didn't take long for the cops to show up. They rushed to the second floor of the building and firmly knocked. But there was no response. They knocked again and again and again, but no one answered the door. By this time, something could be heard from inside the house. The cops heard music and hymns in a muffled tone, but no one was opening the door. Who was it inside the house who was talking in tongues but refusing to acknowledge the cops' presence? The fire was still ablaze, so the cops decided to break in. Ashwara, I don't know the names of the cops present there that day or how many there were. Yeah. But what I do know is this. Whoever there was, wasn't prepared for what they were about to find. What they were about to walk into was India's most haunting sight. The door creaked open and the chanting became louder and clearer. The cops on site could hear the chant radiating from different parts of the house, but it wasn't a living person murmuring these muffled hymns. It was a voice recording. Five speakers playing the same thing a taped sermon by Joyce Meyer, an American TV evangelist and global sensation in the spiritual Christian world. As the cops walked through the house, they discovered hundreds of spiritual books spread on the floor. The house wasn't filthy, but it was dusty and that was eerie. It was evident that the house had not been burglarized or ransacked, but they had no clue what they were walking into. Without stopping to take in all the strange contents of the house, the cops hurried to the source of the fire coming from behind the bathroom door. As the knob turned and the door opened, the cops were horrified to find the source of the smoke. Sitting in the bathtub was a charred human body. The body was that of 77-year-old Orbindo Day. Gasoline and matchsticks lay beside him. From a cursory investigation, it appeared that Orbindo Day had set himself on fire, 
The police didn't need Sherlock Holmes to tell them that this was going to be a complicated case. Too many things about this house were off. The next cryptic detail cops discovered was folded paper notes. All around the house were handwritten paper notes hidden in corners, spread on the floor, hidden in jars and pillowcases. I'm sure I know I've set up a horrific scene for you, but like, what what do you make of all of this? I think I don't have enough information to draw any conclusions just yet, hmm. but I want to point out that this sounds like an incredibly eerily staged house. It sounds like one of those haunted houses you see at carnivals, perhaps. Yeah. But I don't know. Was this a sinister murderer's plot? Was this actually Orbindo Day who had committed suicide by lighting himself on fire, which is very unusual, hmm. by the way. I don't know. Yeah, during my research about this, it. It didn't make sense at all. But yeah. if you think the hidden notes or the chants are weird, it gets even weirder. The cops could smell a stench coming, but that stench wasn't coming from the charred human body. As the cops tracked the source of this smell, they realized it was coming from behind one of the bedroom doors. The door to the bedroom was unlocked, so they pushed it open and immediately a deathly odor overpowered their noses. They instantly knew that stench. It was the smell of a corpse, a rotting corpse. But when the police peered into the room, there was no corpses immediately inside. In fact, they couldn't see anything because the room was pitch black. The curtains were drawn, the windows were covered with paper, and every opening was stuffed with cloth. As the police drew back the curtains and light entered the room, the disturbing contents of those chambers became all too apparent. In the middle of the room, tucked neatly into the bed, was a well-dressed skeleton. Yes, almost looking as if it were comfortably asleep, was a skeleton with clothes on. There were also two more skeletons in the room, but they weren't human. These were the skeletons of two dogs, with ribbons tied on them and their paws over each other in an endearing position. Lying beside the bed was a lunchbox filled with rotting food. Even though the room reeked of death and disgust, it was also meticulously organized. The scene was so well preserved and arranged that the cops were baffled. Nothing was making sense. The police discovered that the skeleton in the bed was Debjani, or Bindo's elder daughter. Both father and daughter were dead. But clearly, while the father had just passed away, his daughter had been dead for a very long time, long enough for the flesh to decompose, leaving only her bones. In the bathroom, beside Orbindo's burnt corpse, the cops also found a suicide note that read at the end, Love you, Beta. Beta being an endearing term for your child. But Orbindo's Beta, his child, had clearly been dead for a long time. So who was this note intended for? It turns out it was Debjani's younger brother, Orbindo's son, Partho Day. The 44-year-old was found by the cops not long after they stumbled across Debjani's skeleton. Partho was in the house, alive, and banging his head against the walls of the living room. The moment the police found him, the case blew open, its news reverberating across Kolkata, across West Bengal, and hell, even across India. Kankal Kando, or the skeleton case, captured everyone's mind. They had their lead suspect right in front of them. Partho Day was immediately arrested. The cops had their lead suspect in custody. So while they were investigating the house to look for clues, Partho was interrogated. He presented at the facility frazzled. He spoke in a low yet sweet voice. An officer later recalled, Mr. Partho Day started behaving abnormally in the morning, raising our suspicions. He broke down on being grilled. And once Partho broke down, the details he shared were absurd and unbelievable. It's important to note, Partho was dirty, his nails were blackened, he smelled like the very corpse discovered in the house. That's because Partho revealed he had been sleeping in the same room where his sister's corpse was found. Not just in the same room, but sleeping in the same queen bed beside his sister every night for the past six months. Partho told the police that his sister had been dead since December of 2014. It was now June 2015. The lunchbox full of rotten food had been used to feed Debjani daily, and the dog skeleton belonged to their two pet Labradors that had died the previous August and September. Partho said they were kept there to keep Debjani company. 
When the investigators asked him about the cause of his sister's death, Partho professed his love for her and scoffed at the idea that he would harm her in any way. In fact, he said that it was the love for his sister that made him take extra measures to capture her memory. That's why he had sealed and darkened the bedroom so that no air came in or out in order to retain the smell of his sister. That's why he slept beside his sister's maggot-covered corpse so that he could feel close to her. Now, this is the part of the research, Ashwara, where I quite literally gagged. We have covered gory cases in the past, take Natari, for example, but I have never quite come across something like this. No, neither have I. I don't think we've ever covered something quite this disgusting and eerie. But I think this case is further complicated by the fact that this is clearly the work of an unstable and mentally Mm. ill man. Like he slept with his sister's corpse for half a year. Why would he do that? Nobody knows the answer, but like, that's what I meant when I said this is a case of too much love. Yeah. As Partho kept talking, the police realized that they might not be dealing with a psychopathic murderer, but a schizophrenic person and perhaps a schizophrenic family. In fact, the police did not charge Partho with murder. Instead, he was booked under two minor penal codes, one for a negligent act likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life, and the other for the omission to give notice or information to a public servant. These lighter sentences were punishable by up to just six months in jail. The doctors urged the court to send Partho to a mental health facility, and the court agreed. Partho was sent to the Pavlov Hospital for the mentally ill. All right, Aran, so for argument's sake, I'll believe that Partho Day didn't hmm. kill Devjani. That still leaves the question open. How did she die? I'm yeah. sure the cops must have asked him for his explanation. Did he have anything to say? Yeah, so when he was in his frazzle state, he refused to answer that question. But yeah. right before he was sent to the Pavlov Mental Health Hospital, mm-hmm. he made his first media appearance in which he did answer this question. Without my consent. I consider Amake Kono document like a So it is illegal to keep me here. It is illegal to keep me here. I am a free citizen. I want to go to mother house. I have committed no crime. As no crime has been shown to me that I have committed. In fact, I have got there is a lot of property which is then my in that clip, Partho tells the media that Dev Jani had apparently fasted to death due to religious reasons. Partho says he tried to stop his sister, but her spiritual convictions were too ardent. But fasting for what spiritual reasons? What was Dev Jani trying to achieve? The cops didn't immediately get an answer from Partho, and they weren't allowed to berate and interrogate him when he arrived at the hospital. Once in psychiatric care, the doctors realized Partho needed help, guilty or not. Partho was diagnosed with depressive tendencies and placed under special care. Psychiatrist Sabyasachi Mitra speculated he might have necrophilic tendencies, one where someone has sexual intercourse with corpses. Journalists from a Bengali newspaper visited Partho and returned with an uncanny account of the man. They said that Partho was incoherent and agitated and he was stinking from infections contracted during his proximity to his sister's corpse. Every now and then he would scream, Jesus, Jesus, and occasionally shout for the doctors and attendants to come attend to him. One of the staff said he would only calm down when the doctors would assure him that Jesus and Mary will come and touch him. At the hospital, Partho was put on medication and within a few days, the psychosis subsided. He warmed up to the doctors and spoke to them at length. In an interview with two doctors, Partho began to reveal the details of his twisted life over the past few months. He told the doctors that he took good care of the bedroom where Devjani's skeleton lay. Bed sheets and blankets were changed daily and the skeleton was neatly tucked under a blanket with the skull prodding out exactly in the same pose in which she used to fall asleep. He had breakfast, lunch and dinner with Devjani's skeleton and used to offer her rice, dal, fish, dry food, biscuits and tea. Partho told a senior police officer that Devjani came back to life every night to consume the food. 
The details were signs of a disturbed mind, but again didn't answer the main questions. If Parthu claimed to love his sister so much, why hadn't he stopped her from fasting to the point of starvation? And what about his father? What had driven him to suicide? While doctors pieced together the story from Partho, the cops relied on the contents of three Robinson Street to piece together their investigation. The police continued to discover handwritten notes hidden in walls, in pillow covers, and God knows where else. One by one, the notes were pieced together and a bizarre discovery was made. The handwritten notes were full of communication between the three family members. In fact, it appeared it was their main way of speaking to each other. Aryan, are you telling me that the three members of the Day household were only communicating with each other through handwritten notes, despite literally living under the same roof? They weren't talking to each other at all? They lived under the same roof, but there was literally no verbal communication. It was all via notes. During this time, Orbindo's autopsy came back, and it confirmed the corpse's initial suspicions. Orbindo had committed suicide, but the cops still didn't know why. The suicide note they found that was signed, Love You Beta, said that nobody was to be blamed for his death and that he loved his son, but didn't expand upon the reason behind his suicide. Debjani's autopsy also wasn't very helpful. There was not much you could tell from just skeletal remains other than injuries or trauma, and for what it's worth, Debjani's skeletal remains didn't have any sign of injury or physical trauma. I'm sure the cops must have felt defeated. They're finding evidence, but none of it was leading them to the truth. It was like they were finding pieces of the puzzle, but weren't able to piece the puzzle together until they found the instruction manual of the puzzle, which was a set of books, those cursive books we learned writing in. You remember those? (laughs) Yeah, of course I do. Well, he owned a set of 10 that he used as a journal. He used to journal his life's records in them. In fact, one of the excerpts from that journal reads as follows. My sister was growing old and she was asserting her independence. My mother was jealous of her. We went on vacation. My mother made a strip in the bathroom. My mother thinks I'm impotent. She wanted to see me develop a relationship. This is why she used to send a maidservant to my room to excite me. In these diaries, Partho is referencing his mother, Aarti Day. But where was Aarti? Well, she had been dead for nearly 10 years. So how was she a central figure in Partho's diary entries nearly a decade after her death? Ashwara, with the discovery of these books, what started off as a probable murder-suicide soon turned into the story of a delusional family. Like Initially, we thought Partho was the perpetrator of these crimes, but right. now he might just be the victim himself. The diaries were discovered in June 2015, but what was discovered inside the diaries forces us to dial our clocks back decades, all the way to 1968, the year when a loving couple living in Bangalore welcomed into their lives a new member of the Day family, a little baby girl named Devjani Day. A few years later, the couple welcomed an innocent little baby boy, Partho Day. From the start of her family, Aarti made a point to keep her kids protected from the outside world and to not let them socialize with other children from their age. When the kids were young, they used to play Scrabble together indoors and rarely would you find them outside the house in their own friend circles, socializing. This kind of parenting might not seem evil, simply protective, but as the children grew up, the effects of this sheltering impacted their ability to socialize, their relationship with each other and their personalities as a whole. There were also signs that Partho's mother was mentally unstable and also abusive. Partho wrote in his journals that she was jealous of the close relationship between her daughter and son and that she punished her daughter for asserting any independence. Going back to the quotes in Partho's journals, there is a theory that explains them. And it's not to play a blame game, but merely an attempt to understand the causal relationship. The fact that Partho was cloistered with his sister for most of his childhood He modelled her mannerisms, so he resembled more closely to the societal female archetype rather than the male archetype. This is evidenced in Partho's sweet voice and temperament. He has what one would call effeminate characteristics. This is not to say he is gay or impotent, but maybe Partho's mother assumed that just because her son didn't act like a stereotypical teenage boy, he was impotent. From Partho's diaries, Ashwara, we find that his mother was going to crazy extents to reverse his 
apparent impotency. But if you thought that was getting weird, it gets way weirder. The siblings grew up in what anyone would describe as a dysfunctional home. And then in 1988, something happened that would set in motion the events of that Kolkata house of horrors. Partho's paternal grandfather, Gadhadar Day, passed away. But Orbindo refused to go to his own father's funeral because Orbindo believed that death was not real, that the physical cessation of one's body wasn't the end of one's spiritual life. To Orbindo, his father was still alive, and so it was futile to visit his funeral. Orbindo's brother Arun and his mother Shanti did not share his spiritual convictions. They were normal people with normal notions of death. They attended Gadadhar's funeral, and the fact that Orbindo did not caused a major rift in the family. Okay, Aran, let me see if I get this complicated family tree down, right? Yeah, it's a little okay. complicated. Yeah, Shanti and Gadadhar, they have two children, mm -hmm. Arun and Orbindo. Correct. Orbindo marries Aarti and they have two children too, Partho Day and Tebchali mm. Day. Now, the latter two love each other, but they have a bad and poor relationship with their grandmother Shanti and their uncle Arun. Yes, you're exactly right. So, now the patriarch of the Day family is dead. Gadadhar Day is dead. But he did leave behind something of key importance. House number three on Robinson Street. He had purchased this ancestral home in the 1930s pre-independence era from a British man. And the house had proven to be a great investment as the area where it was located had become the most posh locality in Kolkata. After his father passed, Orbindo relocated the family to Kolkata as the property was now in dispute between the two brothers, Arun and Orbindo. The property dispute haunted the family for years and years to come. In fact, Orbindo's family wouldn't move into the home for five years, and when they finally did, the floors were divided among the brothers, with his family on the ground floor and his brother Arun's family on the second floor. The families would spend more than 40,000 rupees a month on security guards just to make sure neither brother stepped on the other brother's floor. After they moved in, the property dispute did not diminish. If anything, it worsened. The families were constantly policing each other's activity. To give an example, when Aarti opened a crash in the ground floor of this house, Arun had it closed down. In a similar fashion, when Deb Jani started her music school on the ground floor, that too was shut down. So now do you kind of get the idea of the nature of the family in which Partho grew up? He was raised by a mother with insane ideas of parenting, a father who had insane ideas of spirituality, and in a family that was in constant disputes over property. During all of this stress and uncertainty, Partho at least had his sister Deb Jani to confide in. But even that comfort would come to an end when Partho's parents decided to separate. And during the custody battle, the parents came up with a very difficult arrangement for the very close siblings. Each parent would get a child. Arti would get Partho and Orbindo would get Debjani. So for the first decade of a child's life, you kept him from interacting with people his own age and now you're taking your son away from his sister, the only person he has ever truly loved. Now, despite their difficulties, both the kids were bright. They passed high school with flying colours and were reunited when they both attended the Raj Bazar Science College to study business technology. Partho was now a man but still struggled socially, and so he spent all of his time with his sister. In fact, professors at their college later said in interviews that the siblings spent an unhealthy amount of time together. People speculated incest, but nothing was taken seriously. After college, Debjani pursued a degree from the Trinity School of Music in London and used her credentials to become a music teacher at the Calcutta Girls High School. Partho pursued a career in business tech, but was having trouble committing himself to one job. The official reason was because the brother was suffering from adjustment issues. And that might be a small detail, but it's a rather crucial one, because it tells you that even as a full-grown adult, Partho didn't have the interpersonal or emotional skills to navigate life alone. He needed his mom, who dictated his entire life ever since he was a kid, and he needed his sister his source of emotional support and his only real friend. Partho finally settled down at a rather prestigious company, TCS, Tata Consultancy Services, and moved abroad to America. But little did he know that one of the two pillars of his life was about to come crashing down. 
At the cusp of the century, around the 2000s, Aarti Day was diagnosed with cancer. And a couple of years after, in 2005, the matriarch of the family died. She had so firmly established herself as the pillar to which this family was bolstered that her death caused this family to come crashing down. With the matriarch gone, there was not a hint of normalcy left in house number three. Neither Deb Jani nor Orbindo attended Aarti's funeral. You know the answer. Neither believed in death. And Partho was still abroad when his mother died. The news brought him to his breaking point. Yes, he had a tough relationship with his mom, but he also loved her and didn't know how to live life without her. He left his well-paying job in America and returned to India, to Kolkata, to house number three. And he would stay there for more than a decade until the day the police saw smoke billowing from the bathroom window. During those years, Partho remained unemployed, his mental state no longer suitable for a career. And Devjani was distraught as well. After her mother's death, she fully committed herself to spirituality. Devjani became fascinated with TV evangelists and Christian speakers like Joyce Meyer, who had cult-like followings across the globe. Now, to each his own, we're all spiritual in our own way, and who am I to judge how someone believes in God? But it does get weird. Devjani followed not just one guru, but 12 religious leaders from different religions, call them saints, teachers, gurus, or whatever you want, that's how many Devjani followed on a daily basis. When the police searched the house in 2015, they found an unbelievable 20,000 books on spirituality. Aran, whenever we've covered matters of over-spirituality, so to say, it's always had something to do with fake Hindu gurus, mm -hmm. like Shakire Khalili or the Burari case. It's always been that. But I think this case is important in pointing out that this has very little to do with what specific religion the Absolutely. person is following and so much more to do with a specific kind of personality type that kind of gravitates yeah. to faith in this particular way. No, I couldn't agree more. And also speaking of that spiritual side, you know, I've yeah. been talking about those notes that were found in the nooks and crannies here and there. Mm -hmm. Those notes started after the mother's death. There was verbal communication before she died, but the verbal communication completely broke down once their mother passed away. Within two years of her mother's death, Devjani also became unemployed, quitting her job in 2007 and fully committing to spirituality. The only source of income of the day family now became the rent they were getting from the tenants in house number three. The family lived as recluses for years to come. They barely ventured out. Their security guard brought them three meals a day. They hardly had anyone over. They barely spoke to each other. It was a dark, dusty and desolate house. And in August of 2014, something happened that broke the camel's back. That month, one of their Labradors died, and the next month, the other one passed away as well. Debjani's delusional notions of spirituality compelled her to believe that this was due to a curse of some kind, and the only way to remove the curse was to fast. And so Debjani began a fast, and I don't mean an intermittent or caloric fast, she stopped eating, period. She said that until God gave her a sign, she would refuse to eat. All this while, she remained in that room which she shared with her brother and now two rotting dog carcasses. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months, but God never gave her a sign, so Devjani never picked up a morsel of bread. On December 29th, Devjani heaved her last breath and she became the third corpse in that accursed room. Ashwara, a fact from this case that still manages to blow my mind, despite everything I've told you, is that Partho's father, Orbindo, didn't find out about Devjani's death until March of next year because the only communication was via notes, and so they never actually communicated the death of his sister. What this means is that they lived in the same house with a corpse and the father did not find out for three whole months. And as for Partho, he was depressed, schizophrenic, and in the most literal sense of the word, insane. Reality to him made no sense. With the death of his sister, he lost everything he ever loved. Partho went on to care for his dead sister even when she was infested with maggots. He did things no normal person would. But you must understand, he lived a life no normal person would either, nor did he have a mind a normal person had. 
He was a kid in a man's body. When the police picked him up on June 11th, nearly six months after his sister's death, Partho had lost the final member of his family, his father, who had killed himself. Partho wasn't a psychopath. He wasn't a killer. He was a broken kid in need of help. Serious medical help. Aryan, from your research into this case, can such extreme cases of mental disorders ever be cured? I understand that they can be mitigated to some degree, perhaps, but usually people like this spend the rest of their lives in a mental asylum. So is there any hope at all for Partho to be able to be reintegrated into society and maybe live a normal life? Ashura, before I came across this case, my answer to that question would have been, no, I absolutely cannot foresee a situation where somebody with such an extent of mental health issues could reintegrate into society. But Partho was different. Remember, even when he was at Pavlov, all he was saying was, I want to be back one with God, I want to be with missionaries, I want to be at church. And so when he was released on the 1st of October of that year, he was received by Father Rodney Borneo. Now, Father Rodney is a priest and he's also the principal of a school in Kolkata. Father Rodney took him under his care and this is what he had to say about Partho, something we have not heard up until now. The first meeting with Partho was totally by chance when the police asked that we be there when they were interrogating him. We were supposed to be a catalyst or a media via which Partho would be able to speak answers to the questions that the authorities had for him. But I remember the moment we met, it was so clear that this was not a person who needed interrogating, but someone who needed understanding. And I think from that point onwards, Partho was no longer someone who was a mystical figure surrounded in the fog of the horror house, but a very real person who could be a very real friend and who had a very real story to tell. After the first meeting, when we continued uh, trying to give support to Partho emotionally or through therapy in whatever way possible, what began to affect all of us was the unnecessary commotion that was being created around the whole story. It was as if people needed a break from all that was around, happening around them and only needed to concentrate on this number three Robinson Street. The aura of this very rich gentleman who had crows and crows of money, who had gone absolutely bonkers, who became a horror figure around whom all these stories were created and webbed. None of it was true. None of it was true. Half of what, and more than half of what the media was reporting was absolute lie. We as a society failed to accept that mental illness is something that is treatable. Aryan, after this entire ordeal of an episode, I'm still left wondering, did Partho ever engage in cannibalism or necrophilia? Ashwara, as much as I would love to give you a certain no, that is still left up to speculation. Yeah. We don't know. But what I can say certainly is that Partho appeared to get better. It wasn't like society immediately accepted him, but he got better. He sold house number three to a real estate promoter for 40 crores and bought himself an 11th floor apartment in another area of Kolkata, Wadgunj. He started organizing festivals and little by little tried to acclimatize back into a society that had labeled him a cannibal, murderer and psychopath. In what is a beautiful testament to how much he had improved, here's an audio of Partho singing at an event for the mentally unwell that he himself organized. Oh my darling, oh my darling, oh my darling, Clementine, you are gone and left forever, dreadful sorrow, Clementine. That was Partho's sweet Bengali accent humming away at a melodious tune. On February 20th, 2017, Partho posted on Facebook a picture of himself. The next day, on the 21st, he shared a quote on his social media. It's better to light a candle than to curse darkness. He was getting better, wasn't he? Everyone thought so, even Father Rodney did. But a day after sharing that quote, on February 22nd, 2017, Father Rodney received a call. Partho wasn't answering his phone nor opening his door. There was smoke coming from his 11th floor apartment in Wadgunj. The cops were called. 
what they found was a scene eerily similar to the one in Kolkata from 2015. In the bathroom was a bottle of gasoline, matchsticks, and Partho's charred body beside it. No suicide note, no social media post. Nobody knows why Partho killed himself. They all thought he was getting better. But alas, Partho Day is no more. All the days are dead. But what remains is a legacy of mental health. As a society, we can choose to tarnish those who suffer, make fun of them, call them names, or we could help them, tell them they're not alone. It's up to you.